السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا جزاكم الله خيرا to the organizers I wish I was able to join you all in person uh, but inshallah ta'ala this virtual presentation will be of benefit and I look forward to the live discussion the topic of this presentation is on atheism and skepticism so we don't really need to say too much about the importance of this topic because the entire conference is on atheism. But it's worth reminding ourselves that we are living in the age of atheism, as some have called it. We're living in a time where modern culture is overwhelmingly dismissive of faith. We find anti-religious themes being explicitly or implicitly promoted in film, television, and music. And it's not just being consumed by people in North America, but because of globalization, the same uh, cultural mediums are being consumed by people in Muslim majority countries. Young Muslims are growing up surrounded by this atheistic rhetoric and, and attitudes, uh, negative attitudes towards religion. And uh, one thing that we're seeing is that uh, there's this rise in negative sentiment towards religion in general, but Islam in particular. Um, religion is seen not just as mistaken or incorrect, but it's seen as backwards and irrational uh, at the very least, sometimes, uh, you know, even uh, seen as, as violent as, and, and destructive. And it's getting to the point where it's barely socially acceptable to even identify as a religious person in some circles. And now as believers, we, we, we believe that this has negative consequences in society. Um, not only is it leading to uh, deterioration in moral values as a result of uh, eradicating any trace of divine guidance in society, but in addition to that, atheism precipitates a crisis of knowledge, uh, an epistemological crisis, and that's what we're going to focus on in this presentation. It results in an attitude of skepticism that impacts many different aspects of society aside from faith. In spite of all these different consequences that we're seeing from the rising growth in atheism, it's uh, interesting to note that uh, there has been very little effort and intellectual resources dedicated to this subject in the history of our uh, da'wah. Uh, Du'at have focused uh, historically on comparative religion in general and really just Christianity. So there's a need for us to devote greater attention to this topic as well. So I want to start by just summarizing the key points of this presentation. And the central idea of this presentation is that atheism is a form of radical skepticism. So just as you can be skeptical about the existence of good and bad, you can be skeptical about the existence of cause and effect, you can be skeptical about whether logic actually works, you can also be skeptical about the existence of God. So you can have a morality skeptic, and the term atheist is just another word for a God skeptic. Um, and when you realize that, then you see the fallacy underlying atheism, the logical fallacy underlying atheism is that it results in the same kind of complete epistemological paralysis that radical skepticism results in. You can't form any knowledge. And by addressing radical skepticism, the Quran actually addresses the root cause of atheism and it provides us with a proper epistemology. The Quran provides us with the principles for how to acquire proper knowledge and how to uh, find trusted sources of knowledge. Muslim scholars historically address the topic of radical skepticism under the term uh, as safsata. Now, safsata is often translated as sophistry, uh, but the term sophistry in English can just be, it can mean somebody using fancy language. So really the term uh, safsata is better captured by translating it as radical skepticism, since that's what the scholars who uh, were using the term meant by it. As safsata is radical skepticism, and it's something that came out of ancient Greek philosophy. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, as far as uh, I'm aware, is the first to really point out the connection between uh, as-safsata and atheism. And he does this in, in numerous works, and I've uh, you know, examined this in, in more detail in an article uh, for Yaqeen Institute, where I looked at 100 citations of, uh, of quote, quotes from Ibn Taymiyyah's different works. And uh, out of those 100 citations, uh, 57 of them were from his work, Dar'u Ta'arud al Aql wa Naql. So it's one of the most important works that really highlights this connection. And one of the things we're going to see is that 
um, by examining his writings and by examining what the Quran says about radical skepticism, the Quran shows us that belief in the uh, belief in Allah subhanahu wa taala, belief in God, is the foundation for all other certainty and knowledge in our life. And so that is what our epistemological framework is built on. Those who deny that uh, fundamental building block of the entire system of, of knowledge, they fall into the trap of radical skepticism, and as a result, they're not able to come to any consistent conclusions about knowledge. The critical point at the center of this discussion is that no matter how much proof and evidence you give to a person, it's not going to benefit them if they don't have the right epistemology, if they don't have the foundations to construct knowledge, if they don't know how to distinguish between reliable and unreliable sources of information, if they don't realize how they can arrive at what is true and what is false, if they don't have that proper framework, then giving them proofs and evidences is not going to be a benefit. As Ibn Taymiyyah mentions, You only give proofs and, and reasoning and, and evidences to someone who has that proper intellectual framework in order to be able to use that, that, that information to arrive at true knowledge. So the central claim of atheists is there is no proof that God exists. And the response is, how do we decide what constitutes proof? How do we establish what is truth? The, when the atheist demands, prove to me that God exists, how is that any different from someone saying to you, prove to me that you exist, prove to me that you're not a dream, prove to me that you're not an illusion created in my mind? How would you go about proving it to a person? Anything that you say could be dismissed by that person and say, oh, well, this is just part of the dream. It's part of the illusion. A moral abolitionist can come to you and say, prove to me there's such a thing as good and bad. Now, the uh, flat earth theorists are another thing that we're seeing more commonly today. Uh, it was it used to be very rare during the 90s before the advent of the internet. It was rare to find that there were people who would believe that the earth is flat. But with the advent of the internet, people find uh, circles online where they can find information that supports what they want to believe and the problem is not that they're uninformed the problem is that they're misinformed they have a huge amount of information now to come to tell you look i have all this evidence that the earth is flat prove to me that the earth is round and no matter what you say to them they will have a response to it they will they will not be convinced by it so does that mean that there's a problem that we don't have proof that the earth is round or is there a problem with the way people are approaching knowledge and similarly, now during the pandemic, we see all these different conspiracies about the vaccines, about whether COVID exists or not. Do people have the right muqaddimat ilmiya, the right intellectual foundations to know what is real and what isn't? Do they know? Fas'alu ahle dhikri in kuntum la ta'lamun. Ask the people of expertise, of knowledge, if you don't know. Do they have the right sources of information to know where to go for trustworthy information? Or do they turn to conspiracy theories because of radical skepticism? The question of do we need proofs to know that God exists, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, answers it in a very interesting way during the courses of his uh, tafsir of Surah Al-Alaq. And he points out uh, these, these two verses, Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq and Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say your Lord? Why is it recite in the name of your Lord? In the, at the beginning of Revelation, the first verses that were revealed are mentioning your Lord. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah says, the reason why it says your Lord and not doesn't say recite in the name of the Lord, for example, is it points out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabb, the Lord is known to those who are being addressed. Uh, uh, that all, uh, the Lord is known to the servant without needing proofs that he's the one who created. And despite the fact that the creation is a proof that, uh, uh, of the creator, لكن هو معروف في الفطرة قبل هذا الاستدلال. It's known in the fitra before needing to, to provide these evidences. ومعرفته فطرية مغروزة في الفطرة ضرورية بديهية أولية. It is something that is instinctual. It's embedded deep within the natural human predisposition. 
About a dozen or so pages later, Ibn Taymiyyah makes the point that prophets were instructed to call their people to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they weren't instructed to call them to philosophically prove God exists before worshipping him. And that's very important and it applies even in the case of someone like Fir'aun who denied the existence of God. يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأْ مَا عَلِمْتُ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَاهٍ غَيْرِ Fir'aun said, oh, oh, oh chiefs, I know of no God for you other than me. So he is denying the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least outwardly. Now despite this, Musa alayhi salam is sent to tell him to have taqwa. And he's not sent to, to call him to, to prove the existence of God. And that's very important for us. And the second point is that Fir'aun, how does he respond to Musa salam's da'wah. He responds by saying, وَمَا رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ He says, what is the Lord of the universe? Now, Ibn Taymiyyah says, some people misunderstand this, and they think that he's asking about the mahiyya, the uh, nature of, of God. Tell me about some information about God, what, what is his definition or whatever. And Ibn Taymiyyah says this is actually incorrect. That's, that, that's not what Fir'aun is doing. He's rather expressing his denial of God in the form of a question. In a mustafhama istifham in kar wa jahd. He's, it's a rhetorical question. What is this Lord of the universe that you believe in? He's not asking about the mahiyya of a rabb, a qarrab that he believes in, in his existence. No, he is just denying God's existence. So how does Musa salam respond to him? Musa salam responds by saying, رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُوقِنِينَ Musa responds, Musa salam responds by saying, He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and all that is between if you have any certainty. If you are those who, if you are amongst those who are the muqinin, those who have any certainty. Now, he didn't just say muqinina bi kada wa kada, right? Instead, bal bal atlaqa fa ayu yaqin kana lakum bi shay'in min al ashya fa awal al yaqin al yaqinu bi hadha al rab. He kept it uh, unqualified. So, any certainty you have in anything, the basis of your certainty, the certainty which grounds all other certainty, is the certainty in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in the existence of a Lord, an all-powerful creator who created everything. And if you say, when قُلْتُمْ لَا يَقِينَ لَنَا بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْأَشْيَاءِ If you say, we don't have certainty in anything, uh, rather we deny all knowledge, this is دَعْوَةُ السَّفْسَطَ الْعَامَّةِ this is the uh, call of, or, or the uh, belief of universal skepticism, as-safsata al amma And no human being can go into that zone of just universal radical skepticism because knowledge is something that human beings necessarily must possess. Every human being who is a, a rational thinking uh, uh, organism, la budda lahu min ilm. He has to have knowledge. You have to have some facts in your mind to even think rationally about anything. Um, and that's, that's the definition of what it means to be a rational creature, is to have some uh, sort of knowledge. So this idea of, I'm just going to deny everything, I'm going to be skeptical about everything, you'd have to be skeptical even that your thoughts mean what you think them to mean. You can't reason in any way, you can't have any intelligent thought about anything if you follow the path of radical skepticism. Let's pause for a moment and just reflect on that statement that God is the certainty of that grounds all other certainties, as I paraphrase it, or he's the, the first of all certainties. How is that the case? How do we understand that? Well, we can recognize as Muslims that when you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you believe that there is such a thing as and good and bad. How would you believe in morality? How would you? What proof would you give somebody that there is uh, moral uh, uh, good and moral bad out there in the world, um, and that there are consequences to our action? Moral ontology cannot exist without a belief in God. Otherwise, it's just people's preferences for uh, different events, different occurrences. But there's no objective morality without belief in the Creator. Similarly, rationality. Why is there a reason that our human 
fallible reasoning seems to correspond to events and occurrences in the world around us? Why is it that our rationality, our logic corresponds to fundamental truths about the universe? There is absolutely no reason to expect that to be the case without belief in God. Without belief in God, rationality happens to be a happy accident. Causality. Why do things happen? Why do we believe that there's a cause and effect? Our human ex expectation that there will be an explanation behind an occurrence, that happens because we believe in, in, in this from our fitrah. It's, it only makes sense because we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cre created and ordered the universe in a way where there are causes and effects. Same thing with our sense reliability. Why is it that uh, we have this expectation? that our faculties of perception provide us with reliable knowledge about our world. We don't believe as, you know, uh, Elon Musk says, maybe we're all living in a, a computer sim simulation, this idea that was made famous by Nick Bostrom. Uh, why is it that none of us takes that idea, idea seriously? Because we don't find it uh, serious to believe that everything our senses convey to us is just a trick. Similarly, we don't believe that our existence is pointless. Rather, we believe there's meaning, there's purpose behind everything. That also comes out of our belief in the Creator. So when you think about it, if you take out belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the certainty that grounds everything else we need in order to function as normal human beings in life, it would completely collapse. We would not be able to have yaqeen in anything. And that shows us the significance of the statement uh, of Sayyidina Musa salam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Rabbu samawati wal ardi wa ma baynahuma in kuntum muqinin if you have any certainty whatsoever and similarly Ibn Taymiyyah says kama qalat al rusul li qawmihim afillahi shak just as the messenger said to their peoples uh, is there any doubt concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how can you have doubt concerning that certainty which grounds all other certainties I hope what we've mentioned is clear, but to further emphasize the point, I'm bringing another quote from Ibn Taymiyyah where he mentions that the prophets were sent to awaken what is already within our fitra. He says, وَلِهَذَا كَانَتِ الرُّسُلْ إِنَّمَا تَأْتِي بِتَذْكِيرِ الْفِطْرَ مَا هُوَ مَعْلُومٌ لَهَا وَتَقْوِيَتِهِ وَإِمْدَادِهِ وَنَفْيِ الْمُغَيِّرُ لِلْفِطْرَ That the messengers, they were sent with reminding the fitra about something that's already known to it and to strengthen it and to support it and to negate and, and eliminate any th factors that have corrupted or changed the fitra. Uh, and this fitra is perfected by the divine revelation. So what's happening is right now people are denying the existence of God. They're denying something that is internally known to their fitra by following this path of radical skepticism. And rather than treating the problem of radical skepticism, we are further uh, digging the hole by making them think that the existence of God does need to be proven by philosophical proofs and we do need to come up with arguments but rather the existence of God is something known to the fitra if we focus on the message of how our meaning in life is grounded by believing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a person's fitra would be naturally drawn towards it of course this raises the question does that mean that philosophical proofs have no merit whatsoever, that there's no point to using any of these philosophical proofs, we shouldn't even discuss them. And Ibn Taymiyyah has a very interesting uh, point about this, and he mentions this in another work, Ar-Rad' al al-Mantiqiyin. He mentions that some people are out there who they've become accustomed uh, they become accustomed to this kind of uh, abstruse, complicated, convoluted way of reasoning, and they're just not happy with something that seems simple and clear. And they want something, they think that the more overly complicated something is, the more sophisticated it is, the more intellectual it is. Uh, and so for somebody like that, you could use some of these logical proofs, provided they don't contradict our uh, theological uh, beliefs, provided they are theologically correct and appropriate, you could use a philosophical argument, not because belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually based on that, but just because of this person's um, predisposition to only being uh, uh, satisfied with this kind of argumentation. I mentioned universal skepticism briefly earlier when Ibn Taymiyyah says that if somebody says we have no certainty about anything, 
um, then they, they fall into this hole of universal skepticism or radical skepticism. Um, but it's important to realize there were actually philosophers who went to that point. Uh, in ancient Greece, uh, because of this culture of doubting and distrusting everything, and you see this to various degrees with different uh, you know, philosophers in ancient Greece, Pyro of Elis was one philosopher who took it to its logical conclusion. He decided that you can't be sure about anything because this person says A, somebody else will say B. So now you can't be sure which is it, A or B. You, there's disagreement. So Pyro doubted everything. He, he, he developed distrust as a philosophy of life. And there's all the sorts of funny stories, and who knows if they're, they're true or not, tales of him walking, almost walking off a cliff or walking into barking dogs. And his students had to go after him and grab him and prevent him from, from, from walking off cliffs because he would say, you know, I, I see a cliff, but how do I know? Maybe it's a mirage. Maybe what I'm seeing is not real. So can we really live like this? Imagine, you know, if you woke up and you ask yourself, did I really just wake up? How do I know I was ever asleep? How do I know that someone didn't erase my memories while I was sleeping? Maybe somebody came in and, and they, they took my brain out of my head, erased my memories and put it back. It's some super scientific civilization did this to me. How do I know my real name? How do I know who I am? How do I know who my parents are? You go through this kind of radical skepticism and you start to doubt and deny everything you know to be true. So what's the solution to that? Do you need to give somebody philosophical proofs that they really woke up? That they, uh, that they weren't asleep, that somebody didn't erase their memories. Ibn Taymiyyah responds to Pyrrhonism by pointing out that to be human is to know. To be human is to have by necessity some rational knowledge. This is what it means to possess rationality. It's impossible to follow this skepticism to its end. So when you see the traces of radical skepticism in something, you have to pull yourself back and say, you know, what, what is real and what isn't? How do I have the proper framework to decide what is true knowledge? Or is this just doubt that's leading me to endless doubt? How does the Quran deal with this topic? It's interesting to note that when the Quran deals with this uh, issue of people denying the truth, it shows the phenomenon of radical skepticism. Despite clear proofs, people will still choose to doubt and deny. They'll make all sorts of demands for spectacular miracles and they'll say, we'll only believe if God shows us this or God does that. And I, you know, prove to me uh, this is true. Prove to me uh, with this miracle or that miracle. But fundamentally, the problem is not a deficiency in the proof. The problem is a spiritual defici deficiency. And that's why a person has made a choice to remain in a state of doubt and, and uncertainty concerning the truth. So Allah subhanahu wa says in Surah Al-An'am, وَلَوْ نَزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ كِتَابًا فِي قِرْطَاسٍ فَلَمَسُوهُ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ لَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ Even if we send down to you, O Muhammad وسلم, a written scripture on a page and they touched it with their hands, the disbelievers would say, this is not but obvious magic. In Surah Al-Hijr, Allah subhanahu wa says, وَلَوْ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَابًا مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ فَظَلُّوا فِيهِ يَعْرُجُونَ لَقَالُوا إِنَّمَا سُكِّرَتْ أَبُصَّارُنَا بَلْ نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ مَسْحُورُونَ Even if we opened to them a gate from the heavens and they were to continue ascending there too, they would say, our eyes have been uh, dazzled. Rather, we are a people affected by magic. So, you, you know, it's, it's amazing to see this kind of mindset, but it still exists today. I saw one debate uh, with an atheist and a theist, and the atheist said, I'm not going to believe in the existence of God until I see a scripture that begins with uh, detailing germ theory and mathematical formulas and this and that. It's He's made his own demands. I want to see this because he, he's a physicist. He wants to see uh, all these scientific facts established in the beginning of a holy scripture. That's uh, his personal demand. And somebody else uh, said uh, in, in another debate, he said, I'm only going to believe in God if I could see him myself. He should show himself to me. And the Quran mentions the same thing. The Bani Israel said, uh, We're not going to believe in you, O Musa. Uh, until we see God directly. So skepticism is a vicious cycle. It fails to lead to any growth in knowledge. A person will stay in that situation of doubt and denial. Now, what are the objections that uh, people may have uh, to this discourse? Uh, interestingly enough, the most vociferous objection uh, that I've encountered has not been from atheists, uh, but it has actually been from fellow Muslims. 
Now, why would Muslims protest uh, exposing the epistemological collapse of atheism? Well, there are some people out there who are extremely sectarian, and they have this irrational animus towards Ibn Taymiyyah. As soon as you mention the name Ibn Taymiyyah, there are some people who start foaming at the mouth and mentioning insults and ad, ad hominem attacks. So what do we say to such people? Well, the first thing is that many, many, many scholars preceded Ibn Taymiyyah in expressing the belief that um, belief in God does not require philosophical proofs. Uh, many scholars of Kalam also acknowledge this, including Abu Mansur al-Maturidi in his tafsir, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, uh, al-Shahrastani. Many scholars said this. And in fact, the view that we don't need philosophical uh, argumentation to establish creed is the mainstream view of the earliest generations of Muslims. That is what the Sahaba believed. Um, so a person needs to do their basic homework before coming with all this animosity towards Ibn Taymiyyah. Secondly, um, when people come out with all this uh, 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 argumentation, it's very telling to note that they don't cite a single work of Ibn Taymiyyah in their uh, uh, objections. And that's why they have all these basic misconceptions that if you actually read Ibn Taymiyyah, you would see this is completely misrepresenting what he's saying. So. A person says, oh, you know, you're, you're, this means Ibn Taymiyyah is against logic and why do you use a computer and how can we believe that, uh, you know, knowledge of God is in the fitra when Allah says in the Quran, Wallahu akhrajukum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'alamuna shay'a. That God brings you out from the wombs of your mothers not knowing anything. Well, first of all, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah himself mentions this verse and uses it to prove that we are not born knowing certain facts. We, what the fitrah means is that we have a natural tendency to come to belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as we have a natural tendency to come to uh, accept justice and mercy and compassion and, all, and believing, preferring truth over falsehood. These are natural tendencies that emerge in the human being. It doesn't mean that they're born uh, with a set of facts in their head. Um, the second objection is one that can come from atheists and typically people who are more philosophically inclined. And the argument is that uh, there's circular reasoning at play here. You're telling us, the atheists will say, you're telling us to believe in God because the fitra says God exists and to believe in the fitra because God says the fitra exists. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, what they're doing is they're confusing awareness of a structure with efficacy of its function. Very simply, you don't need to be aware that you have a fitra in order for the fitra to work. Just like you don't need to be in, uh, aware of your pancreas in order for your pancreas to work when you're digesting food. You don't need to be aware of your small intestine in order for your small intestine to digest food. The fitra will work if I present to you the, the message of Islam, you will find you're naturally inclined to, uh, to, uh, to appreciate the values of Islam if you have a clean fitrah, if your fitrah is uncorrupted. That's just how it works. So we're not establishing a philosophical argument based on your acceptance that the fitrah exists. Rather, our explanation of the fitrah is a theological explanation to explain the phenomenon that people have a natural tendency to believe in God. The final objection is one that um, typically you'll see more from uh, lay people. Uh, you won't see this being used by any um, uh, atheist intellectual because it's they would know this is, is not a intellectual objection whatsoever. But you find this in some quarters of social media, they'll say, well, if you say that belief in existence of God is natural, then why is polytheism so common? And this just shows their lack of familiarity with Islamic theology. I mean, the Quran explains this explicitly. The Quran explains the majority of people have strayed from their fitrah and engaged in shirk. The majority of people follow unsubstantiated ideologies and vain desires. So this is not something unexpected or surprising to Muslims. This further proves the point. So I want to conclude, uh, inshallah ta'ala, by saying that what we should do is revive a Quranic da'wah rather than, rev than a da'wah which increases people's doubts and confusions. Sometimes the treatment is worse than the disease. And I've seen people with questions about Islam and religious doubts, they go to someone who's not properly equipped and they end up even more confused. 
and in, uh, you know the person provides them well, well this is the proof that God exists or whatever and they give them uh, you know a lot of complicated arguments and the person researches it and they find that there are well established atheist philosophers who have completely dismantled this argument altogether and now we're, what did they do they're all confused and it plays into the basic fallacy that person has to begin with which is the idea that belief in God is something uncertain um, that we need philosophical proof to establish it. When it. Whereas in reality, faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the message of Islam is the basis for everything else in our lives to be meaningful, to have a proper understanding of morality, causality, of rationality, of all these different things that we need in order to form a coherent and meaningful picture of the world around us and our purpose in lives. We need our purpose in our lives. We need to believe um, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ground all of that. So inshallah ta'ala we should focus on reviving uh, that Quranic da'wah. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan for your attention and I look forward to the discussion inshallah.